So welcome to our webinar on powering up the future with GAN. As I mentioned before, this is the first session of the webinar series organized by CGD. My name is Nare Gabrielian and I'm a product marketing manager at CGD and I will be your moderator today. I'm happy to present CGD, CGD's chief commercial officer, uh, Andrea Bricconi, who will talk about today's topic. However, um, before we dive into today's topic, there are some ground rules. We will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Also, due to many participants, we ask you to keep your microphones muted and post your questions in the chat. And I will read, read them in the order they come in for Andrea to answer at the end. If we don't have, if they don't manage to answer all the questions during the session, we will send your answers by an email. Also, I'd like to mention that we are recording this session and the link to the recording will be available after the webinar. And now over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Nare. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the first of a series of webinars that Cambridge Gun Devices is delivering with the topic gallium nitride and gallium nitride in power electronics and in general, which is the benefit of this technology in a variety of segments. Um, we are starting today with a general picture. Um, we are going then in March um, deeper into details when Professor Florian Udrea, who is a Cambridge GAN Devices uh, CTO, will go for a deep dive in GAN devices and technologies uh, we respect also to silicon and silicon carbide. And then we will focus more and more into uh, our technology, ICGAN, and quality and reliability and the performance in a variety of applications with respect to, for instance, other GAN concepts. So today um, we stay at, at a high level and try to understand what GAN can do. And uh, with, a, with a short introduction to also uh, the technology itself. My name is Andrea Bricconi. I'm a physicist. Um, I've been working in this industry for the last 25 years in the semiconductor industry and uh, in a variety of roles from manufacturing all the way to sales. And in particular, in the last 12 years, I have been involved in gallium nitride. And uh, I have kind of traveled the world to understand how GAN can actually deliver um, value to customers, address their pain points. And since 2020, I have joined uh, Cambridge GAN devices or CGD for simplicity. And um, at that time I was vice president of business development and now I'm covering sales and marketing on a global basis. And I'm based in Munich, Germany. So at first I would like to give you a very short introduction of what uh, CGD is. Um, Cambridge GAN devices uh, came to life a few years ago as a span out from Cambridge University. Professor Udrea, the CTO, and Dr. Giorgia Longobardi, the CEO, founded the company after many years of consultancy to major semiconductor manufacturers on wideband gap devices, especially on reliability aspects. Since then, we grew, of course, we developed the technology, and um, we are now operating from five different locations worldwide, so we have a global footprint. Uh, we went in mass production last year, when we also uh, announced the first few products and now we have quite a significant traction delivering uh, high volumes to a significant number of customers and in the meantime we grew significantly also in terms of number of employees of course we are also working with a lot of partners for system uh, understanding and delivering um, very i would say compelling reference designs um, one, of course, could ask the reason why another uh, GAN manufacturer. There are a few. Uh, some of them are very successful in the market. At the end, of course, the, the obvious reason is that we have a technology that we think is quite um, interesting. Actually, it is delivering a lot of advantages on an application basis. And that is an obvious thing. We want to bring our wonderful technology to the market. But I, I would say that there is even the most important um, reason why we do exist. And it is that at certain point, um, while facing the global challenges, things like uh, climate change and how power electronics can help 
to bend the curve of energy consumption. Um, I would say a few of us um, professionals who have spent many years in this industry and, and share the same value, how we can do things better, uh, have gathered into this company because we have a sense of commitment uh, to others and to the environment. So we do things together with our communities to try to have an impact. And of course, by doing what we do best, which is designing, manufacturing and commercializing power semiconductors. And that is basically uh, the, the reason why Cambridge Gun Devices actually operates. So in the next few minutes, what I would like to give you is a bit of a context because I, I spoke about climate change. So why do we need more uh, efficient power semiconductors? Um, why GAN is a serious candidate, not just for the future, as the title of this presentation uh, suggests, but also for the present. And then we're going to discuss some of the concepts that are out there. And uh, of course, by focusing in particular to ICGAN, which is a CGD's technology that we have brought to the market since last year. And we will conclude with some, uh, I will try to draw some conclusions out of that. Um, again, launching the next webinar when uh, we were, are going to much more details on a technical level. First of all, I said, let's put things in context. <clears throat> Today, of course, everybody is aware there is a, um, a significant growth of energy consumption year after year, and there are mega trends which explain that from the population growth, the GDP growth, uh, the quality of life is growing, so there is more demand to access um, goods. Uh, there is urbanization, digital transformation. There is a, a significant amount of data that have to be handled and computed. And so uh, what we see is that, of course, as everybody is aware of, that has is uh, somehow consequences in terms of CO2 emissions as of 2019 more than 36 uh, gigaton of CO2 have been emitted, and typically these numbers are underestimated. But also if you look at things from in terms of electricity consumption, uh, 23,000 terawatt hour have been consumed just in 2019. And the trend is to uh, significantly increase the demand for electricity over time. Now, that requires, of course, that as far as power electronics is concerned, is to put in place um, technologies that help to improve efficiencies and therefore have somehow having an impact in terms of uh, making a better use of the energy. Um, there are, of course, um, driving forces towards ener energy efficient solutions. I mean, if we think about electrification, I mean, the way we are trying to move from an oil-based uh, society into, for, for mobility into um, e-vehicles, of course, uh, that is driving um, the onset of specific new semiconductors that improve the efficiency of, of uh, power conversion in cars, for instance, extend the battery range, and so forth. Renewables, again, to move out of um, oil, of course, uh, everybody is thinking about renewables. Governments are investing in renewables, and that means electrification as well, and with the highest efficiency possibly. Connectivity, well, everybody has experienced in the last few years what happened during the COVID time. Um, the demand for video streaming, conference calls over the, the web, and so forth. So big data, cloud computing, 5G, and the upcoming 6G, these are all things that are actually demanding energy. And we need to make uh, every effort, I think, in the power electronics industry to deploy those technologies that help to waste as uh, low energy as possible from all the, the demand that is required. So um, fortunately, there is now an ecosystem, an ecosystem that somehow uh, helps the GAN to finally deploy its potentials. So governments and policies are now going all into the direction of uh, setting new targets, compelling targets for things like CO2 emissions or um, efficiency in power converters. Think about server. We are approaching the 97% and beyond. 
And this, of course, uh, somehow shows the limits of uh, silicon that in some case, of course, cannot easily cope with those new targets. We have seen investments, a lot of investments in the wideband gap industries, starting from silicon carbide. Um, new foundries are coming and are offering um, founder services for wideband gap devices, silicon carbide and GAN. So in general, there is also an increased demand for portability. So for energy efficient, um, power dense, so miniaturized devices by the general public. And all those things go into the direction of having um, semiconductor technologies that, that enable high power density as well as high power efficiency. Um, I would like to briefly discuss uh, some basics without pretending to go into the latest detail, of course. Um, but in fact, why we are talking about GAN? We are talking about GAN because it has some intrinsic features that make it um, somehow very relevant for power convention with respect to silicon and some specific figural merits that um, are the reason why we expect higher efficiency and higher power density. I briefly touched them um, when we talk about gate charts. Of course, that has to do with the driving losses and what GAN delivers, what GAN has as a, a in the feature is basically uh, one order of magnitude better gate charges than silicon and by the way, also silicon carbide. And that means that is really one of the key why GAN transistors enable high efficiency at much higher frequency than today. And higher frequency in turn means that of course, the device of a power converter can shrink and, and become smaller or for the same volume, you can squeeze more power out of it. And of course, that means power density. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the charge stored in the output capacitance or QOSS, that figure of merit somehow has to do with um, the losses during the switching event. And having, uh, like GAN has, uh, not an order of magnitude, but I would say uh, five times better than what silicon is today, means that, of course, losses, switching losses are greatly reduced. And last but not least, GAN and silicon carbide um, are majority carriers kind of semiconductors, so they don't have any minority carriers. And that means, in particular, that during hard commutation, you don't have any reverse recovery charge to be depleted. So, in a nutshell, that um, enable the use of new topologies. Some of them are simpler with less power count, reduced power count, than the actual top topologies for silicon-based um, power converter. Uh, half bridge, hard switch half bridge is enabled, like totem pole PFC. And totem pole is not a new topology, is there since uh, ages with IGBTs, but why superjunction cannot basically operate in that without adopting quite complex control uh, techniques, with GAN, uh, that is pretty easy, and many have demonstrated how the efficiency can be brought to the 99% level with a reduced amount of pieces of components. So, uh, in a nutshell, and again, this one will, will be the, the, the focus set, uh, target of the next webinar for those who really want to go to the deepest detail. In a nutshell, GAN showed already many years ago all the potential. And the topic was, of course, to bring it to the to the market in a way that is as reliable as possible. There is quite a consensus that thanks to gal galimnitride, um, applications, of course, have a great advantage. Um, you can achieve much faster switching and low energy losses. You can achieve much higher power density. We can debate whether it's two times, three times, five times. There are examples of any kind, but on average, the power density improvement is significant. And of course, together with the power density, uh, smaller and lighter um, converters are achieved. All this without a penalty on cost, because although today gallionitride devices are still more expensive in the high voltage domain than silicon for the same RDSON, at system level, they are already delivering 
um, a significant system cost reduction. Because just to make an example, a totem pole topology is in general cheaper because it contains much less components than a, a complex uh, PFC topology based on, uh, on the boost concept and with silicon devices. Higher efficiency means reduced cooling effort, and that, of course, means a significant cost reduction for those who uh, actually manufacture the final application. Um, I would like to, to somehow show you a what if. Um, the topic is what if GAN is adopted in data centers? So in data centers, there are dozens, uh, I mean, thousands uh, of servers, of course. Um, every server has a power supply. If GAN was replacing uh, the, in the server power supply a silicon MOSFET high voltage in the ACDC and uh, also the equivalent silicon MOSFETs in the uh, secondary stage of the DCDC, so if the power supply of the server is made all in GAN and then you multiply by all the server in a data center, in a typical hyperscale data centers, for, in for instance, and then you multiply for all the data centers that are deployed worldwide, we have calculated, together with others, of course, that that could say just this, more than 12 terawatt hour electricity per year, which can be also seen in terms of 9 million tons, metric tons of CO2 saved. And all of this, because data centers are quite, uh, I would say, subjected to a significant high electricity bill, that also means a significant advantage from that standpoint. Uh, up to $1.6 billion electricity bill saved. Or, or, for instance, you can somehow translate that into um, 20 million less consumption of uh, barrels of oil or 2 million less cars driving our streets every year. So, again, these are numbers subjected to some assumptions, but um, you don't have to look through the last digit. What you have to to what I would like you to look at is the trend. This is just by replacing silicon in the server power supplies. You can imagine if you extend the exercise to all other applications like adapters, chargers, and so on. And you can imagine if you take into calculation also all the other elements that are somehow linked to the efficiency of the power conversion. So, um, the next step is somehow to say, OK, now GAN has great potential. It could translate in great benefit for the environment, for instance. But how does it look like? Now, I have been working in this industry for many years, as I said, um, to basically that I, I don't want to show less than respect for my GAN competitors. They have made great effort to bring a lot of different concepts in the market. So today I don't want to discuss what I think could uh, some weaknesses could be for every of the concept, but more to just illustrate what they are, uh, oversimplifying perhaps because there are many different flavors. And I will start to I would like to start from the CAS code. So GAN transistor by nature are depletion mode, and of course you want to have a, a normally off device, also for safety reasons. So um, the trend has been from the very beginning of industrialization of GAN to associate uh, it for, to the depletion mode GAN hemp a low voltage silicon MOSFET. So from the outside, what the user operates is it drives the silicon MOSFET gate and which basically operate the GAN hemp and these becomes a normally off transistor. Now, of course, you would ask why uh, enhancement mode uh, have not been developed. They actually have, and in fact, that's the so-called discrete hand, enhancement mode have been developed and now deployed to the market. Um, there is a, a little compromise at the pure gun performance level, but they are single chip enhancement mode device, so normally off by nature. But one of the differences between gun and silicon and silicon carbide is that those two are vertical devices, while in gun, um, they are GAN transistors are lateral, so um, the current flows horizontally in a 2D plane, 
and source drain and gate are on the same side, which means that um, a significant level of integration is now feasible and has been proven in a variety of um, examples. I would like just to cluster them into two main. There are those who actually go all in, meaning integrate it onto the same piece of chip, onto the same chip, both the power transistor and the gate driver. It, and this concept is in the market. It has been in the market for a few years now, very successful, especially in the low power domain. By low power, I mean uh, 65 watt and below, uh, or even uh, above 65 watt, but, but still in the low 100 watt range. Um, what CGD has done is to go into different direction. We basically think that we want to uh, have a scalable concept that works perfectly well, whether we're talking about high RDSON components, so for low power, or low RDSON components for high power. Whether we're talking about high voltage, what we are uh, manufacturing now, or low voltage. So <clears throat> we basically uh, believe that um, integrating the full gate driver uh, under this scalability purpose might cause some problems, especially at high power. At the end of the day, you have a gate driver sitting beside a heat generator, which is the power transistor. So what we do is integrating a set of logical functions into the power gun chip, but not the foot gate driver. So that basically our customers are using whatever gate driver they're used to, to utilize for their silicon MOSFET, because what we do with all these functions is to take the complexity out of the driving circuit into the gun transistor itself. And in fact, that is why we call it smart hand. What happens is that, that basically our devices can be driven basically like a MOSFET without the needs of any additional circuitry. And I would like to go into a little detail on this one. So what you see when you um, evaluate a, a gun hand by CGD is something that contains one chip, enhanced mode gun silicon, where there is the power transistor and integrated a so-called smart interface, IC gun. So from the outside, that can be driven by any gate driver or for low power directly by a controller. And as a magnified view, what you, um, what you have here, and I'm overly exaggerating the, the, the area required by, by that because really this is a tiny fraction of the old chip. There are several elements that basically provide all those necessary um, sense protection uh, and reliability elements that will make the gun gate, internal gun gate, operating safely. And uh, that can be interfaced to the outside world like a MOSFET. On top of it, we are also integrating a current sense function, meaning, of course, um, a function that intercepts a fraction of the source current to deliver through an up, a, a dedicated pin the current sense signal to the controller. Um, this is quite interesting, I think, because, of course, this way you can accommodate our devices directly to the ground plane. And that means, of course, a significant improvement a possible improvement from a cooling perspective. Um, as I said before, customers are appreciating um, this kind of uh, solution. And um, in terms of ease of use, and of course, in terms also of performance. Um, when we look at what do we mean by IC GAN, we can highlight some of the differences between uh, uh, us and other concepts. Generally speaking, uh, an enhanced mode gun transistor is something that has a threshold voltage in the range of one to two volts. This can be perfectly fine, but it does not forgive uh, designs, PCB designs that are not optimized. So, um, of course, you don't want to have undesired return on when your, the device is supposed to be off. And so, we see that still today in the market, many are operating these devices by delivering negative voltage to the gate. So that when the device is off, it's, it's kept off all the time. And the, the gate, the gun gate 
does not work like uh, in a silicon MOSFET. It is limited to six to seven volts for reliability reasons, because it, it really, if it is operated above seven volts constantly, uh, there is a significant degradation in the lifetime of the device. What we have with ICGAN is an enhancement mode GAN transistor that has a threshold voltage at three volts, which is unique, and it can be operated all the way to 20. Plus, it has an integrated Miller clamp that pulls down the gate to zero when the turnoff needs to be a real zero volts turnoff. Um, so, from, from an, an external uh, perspective, basically, I'm talking about here the yellow curve. One drives uh, um, CGD's GAN transistor all the way to 20 volts. What internally the GAN gate sees is something that is uh, automatically clamped at six volts. It's not fixed, meaning that we know also from literature that um, the voltage that is required by the GAN gate depends on the temperature, on the operating temperature. That is very important for reliability reasons. So uh, our internal clamping mechanism somehow um, adapts depending on the temperature and reduces the gate voltage as the temperature goes down, because this is exactly what is required. Let me make now an example of uh, also the performance and the advantage in terms of ISO use. So, um, I, I have plotted here three are different arrangements for a half bridge configuration. Those two on the left are coming from some of my competitors' uh, application nodes. Um, the example on the left is an half bridge with a standard half bridge driver. And then there is a suggested circuitry to provide those functions that are needed to the GAN transistor, like clamping with Zener diodes. Uh, resistor and capacitors to uh, deliver negative voltage for turn off, as well as to optimize turn on and turn off speed. And at the end, this circuit is requiring 16 external components. It's quite well known, but of course, one can say some of these complexity can be put in the driver. And in fact, this is just an example NCP 51820. This is a half bridge driver that has um, a significant, um, I would say, amount of performance that somehow um, does not require uh, the clamping uh, diode and uh, Zener diodes outside. It's uh, taken care by the driver itself, and that greatly reduces the number of components that are needed to operate the half bridge. But of course, um, the gun specific half bridge driver is more expensive. So CCD's IC GAN basically only requires two components to operate with a standard driver, as I said. And these are the two capacitors that are needed to power up the internal IC GAN circuits. Plus, of course, you can always, as usual, also with silicon MOSFET, add uh, um, gate resistors to, I mean, optimize the turn on. Um, of course, you could ask whether these um, ICGAN um, to operate, whether ICGAN to operate is somehow introducing additional losses. Well, the answer is no, because of course we have designed it to make sure that it operates only when it needs to. And especially at light load and no load, of course the losses are minimized because it, it, it means it serves no purpose. So at the end of the day, a typical design recommendation for our half bridge driver is standard gate driver and up to four components only. If we want to make an example, that is a 350 watt totem pole PFC efficiency curve for in high line and low line. We basically are in the 99% uh, area uh, at a full load for high line. And I would like to, to show that basically to highlight that we are at the range of 97% plus in light load condition. So. I would say there is not a penalty for the losses to operate the internal smart interface, but there is a great benefit in terms of ease of use. So last year we have delivered to the market the first few products from 55 million to 200 million, typical are the zone room temperature in the FN 8x8 and 5x6. 
with current sense integrated and of course that smart interface called ICGAN in it. This year we're going to deliver to the market significant more amount of new products covering, um, I mean expanding the portfolio especially towards the lower RDS zone because of course um, high power applications are uh, where we really need to go when we talk about data centers, servers and later on automotive. So we of course have a, a variety of material to support you if you want to test our devices or to design them in, application notes, uh, evaluation boards, reference designs. If you have the chance to look at our website, many of them are there, but of course many more is available um, in case you need support. Um, and in the upcoming few weeks and months, we are going to add uh, additional um, technical material to further go into the details on how to better use our devices. So, and I'm going now, I think I'm almost um, at the end of my presentation. I would like just to conclude briefly that basically there's a clear um, uh, necessity to make a better use of energy and reduce carbon footprint. So that requires new technologies to replace silicon. Silicon is not dead, in my opinion. I think that it will be there for a lot of time, but there are not any fundamental reasons why GAN, when the supply chain is mature enough, why GAN cannot um, somehow replace silicon in every application. It's a matter, of course, of having the capacity deployed, having the cost going down and so forth, that's normal. But uh, also from a reliability standpoint, GAN, I'm absolutely convinced, is uh, will, will demonstrate to be even more reliable than silicon. Um, it's rapidly gained market traction, starting from consumer, but uh, now into industrial application. It's quite uh, um, the adoption in industrial application in data centers, in solar, and, and many other uh, segments is increasing, and automotive will come. Again, for the same reason, um, that I said before, silicon carbide is now deployed in automotive, in traction inverters, onboard chargers. Um, GAN today is not yet there with, with that kind of um, higher than 100 amps uh, devices, but it's coming. And again, from a reliability standpoint, there are no uh, specific reasons why GAN would be less reliable than silicon. And all data are showing that. 600 volt GAN hands, um, as of today, sometimes are still difficult to be handled. In, in my career, I have seen um, huge efforts to design them in from a driving standpoint. Um, basically, the differences between GAN and silicon MOSFETs require some special attention that can be either external, externally uh, by the customers or what we try to do uh, internally by taking care of all those differences. So to, to our knowledge, basically, there's not there's only one technology that has that requires no negative voltage for gate driving that has extended uh, gate voltage uh, window up to 20 volts and that has a true three volts threshold voltage as a single chip enhancement mode 650 volts GAN transistor. And that is basically IC GAN from Cambridge GAN devices. So we are in mass production. Uh, as I said, we are serving customers now and in the next few weeks and months, we are uh, expanding the sales channels to make sure that everybody can have access through different channels, as I said, to our technology. So stay tuned because we are going to announce very soon some important uh, partnerships um, so that from a distribution standpoint, um, everybody will be in the position to, um, to evaluate and order parts. So I think this is uh, the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening. And I would like to hand over to Nare in case there are questions. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the presentation. Indeed, there are some questions and we will try to answer them as many as we can. If, as, as I mentioned earlier, if we don't manage to answer them during this session, we will send your responses via an email. So yeah. the, the first question is from Rajat Kumar Shukla. 
and uh, he's asking why are the um, no sorry the, this one okay um, can you explain uh, on, on slide 11 uh, can you explain the how the low RDS on times reverse recovery charge is beneficial for gun based totem pole PFC well it enables uh, totem pole PFC because basically when you have a, when you have a, um, a half bridge in hard switch in a hard switch topology, you have normally a MOSFET that switches against the body diode of the other MOSFET, the high side versus the low side, or vice versa, depending on the cycle. Now, if you try to make that arrangement with superjunction, well, um, in a superjunction kind of MOSFET, the body diode is not exactly one of its strengths, and therefore, basically, it does not work; it breaks. So. Um, when when you don't have, and that is because the body diode and um, superjunction concept per se has a significant reverse recovery charge. Now, in wideband gap devices, and not just for gun, but also silicon carbide, you don't have minority chargers, so the QRR is basically zero, and that helps uh, in that direction. So you can have hard commutation. Gun does not have a, a, a body diode per se. And so enough bridge can operate hard switched, but in superjunction you cannot achieve that that function. Thank you. Next. Uh, slide 17, also from Rayat. Why are the gate to source Zener diodes, two diodes back to back connected, not there in case of gun based half bridge circuit? So I think the question is why they are back to back connected. And I guess the answer is because you have to protect in both direction. When it's in, in, in forward, when you operate with positive or negative voltage. And in fact, if you look at data sheets for gate voltage, you will see a maximum value both on the high and, and the negative side. The question is why they are not there in case of gun-based half-bridge circuit. Not this why is a gun-based. Uh, yeah. So this is a gun-based, uh, of course, this is a gun from our competitor. Uh, it's a half-bridge made in gun. Also this one, but this one, the clamping function, I mean, to make sure that the gun gate does not see more than 6.5 volts is taken care of by the driver. This way you can avoid components. In our case, it's taken care by the inner structure of the IC gun concept. So from the outside, you can drive to 20 volts, and we make sure internally that the gun gate does not see more than 6.5 volts or 6 volts, depending on temperature. Thank you. Uh, slide 16, uh, the question from Yam Sivakoti. <clears throat> what is the delay between the actual gate signal measured at the device pad and the actual gate signal at the internal EGAN gate? Well, this one is something that um, I would like to answer with some data in hand, which I don't have with me. So if we have your name, of course, we can also socialize the answer to all the other, but I can I can give you the answer by, e by email. I don't have the number with me. Okay, mm, that sounds good. Thank you. Um, slide 17 from Frederic Leclerc. Um, you showed that IC gun only needs one gate resistor. Using two gate resistor is to independently control the turn on and turn off. Is this also possible with one gate resistor using IC gun? So IC gun has embedded capability for um, for DVDT tuning. Uh, now, I have put here uh, our own just to explain that practically um, that's already true in, in the silicon industry. You typically use um, gate resistors in order to optimize the turn on to reduce the speed. So, um, of course, we can go into further details. Um, if you are interested into details of this and how to operate with resistors um, to, to further optimize things, I would suggest to go to, the, to our white paper that is available on the, um, on the website or, of course, to, to go uh, to the next webinar when the, um, the switching performance of IC GAN will be analyzed in the deepest detail. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question from Rayat Kumar Shukla again. What are the advantages of cascode gun compared to single e mode gun? Ah, you want me then to to tell you what I didn't want to, which is um, what I think are the some of the of the weaknesses. But I will try to avoid that. So first of all, if you if you look at the cascode, what you do is to drive the low voltage MOSFET, which means that as you saw also on the parameter table, that you can drive it like a silicon MOSFET. There is not such a question mark, how do I drive a GAN device? Because what you drive effectively from the outside is a silicon MOSFET. And it's quite, I mean, uh, common knowledge how to do that. So the cascode is a normally off GAN component, which can be driven by definition like a MOSFET. So I would say this is the main advantage. Uh, and by the way, it is also probably the main, I mean, the first technology that came to life in the marketplace. If you remember the time of International Rectifier, which is the real pioneer of gallium nitride, and I was there with, with International Rectifier at that time, uh, 20 years ago, um, that was the concept that they brought to the market, as code. And then others followed until the enhancement mode became mature enough and reliable enough to start replacing it. Because, of course, in this case, you have a single chip enhancement mode and with a performance that is, as, um, I would say, excellent, especially with compared with silicon, if compared with silicon. And so at that point, of course, it loses a bit of traction. But still today, Cascode is quite popular especially for that reason. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Andrew Kirk. Are your devices automotive approved? They are not, they are not. So, you know, um, automotive qualification is quite an interesting thing. It can be done at a very different level. Typically, liability stands with the gun manufacturer. Um, so ACQ101 qualification is something that we are going to do, of course, um, but only when the entire supply chain is automotive level. Because I think it, it, it serves no purpose to link to, um, to automotive customers and players if there are some other weak points in the supply chain. So I know that there are uh, automotive level components out there. I'm not sure if all the foundries that are serving um, I mean, gun vendors with their services, with their uh, capacity, have processes that are automotive level qualified. So for the time being, we are not yet entering that market. And by the way, of course, given that we started production last year, we also want to accumulate a significant amount of statistics from our production uh, before really being in the position to declare our parts automotive level. Thank you. Um, I think the time is actually up, uh, so we need to finish in one minute. So I would suggest responding to the rest of the questions via email. What do you think, Andrea? Well, we can take probably one more question. If one more one. question, okay. And there is a question from Niklas Deneke. And thank you for the interesting talk. I have some questions. Is it possible to access the slides uh, like in a PDF format? Absolutely, absolutely. So we are going to, to share the recording, as we said, but of course, also the PDF. There's no point of just sending the recording. So please bear with us uh, one or two days so that we collect all the material and we and you will get the PDF like everybody else. Uh, there is a continuation to their question, which is for the totem pole. I saw at the conference you used the own semi-controller IC. I assume the plot you showed refers to this. Can you share the measurements? Uh, perhaps. Can you repeat the question? So which conference? For the totem pole, um, it doesn't mention which conference. I saw at the conference you used the own semi-controller IC. So maybe you could um, clarify, Niklas. 
which conference? No, I mean, the, the question is okay. you know, whether we can um, sh share the measurements with that controller. Can you share the map? No, it doesn't say. I assume the plot you showed refers to this. Mm -hmm. but can you share the measurements? Well, uh, the, the plot that we share, uh, that I share in this presentation, uh, does not refer to that one. But anyhow, of course, um, we can discuss that offline and I can share much more measurements because I just gave you one example. And uh, in the recent congresses where we have demonstrated our devices in real evaluation boards, we have shared topologies where we had that kind of controller, but also many others. So um, if we can follow up offline, uh, uh, we will be pleased to give you more insights into the measurements, of course. Thank you. <clears throat> So Nare. thank you very much for, for attending. And Nare also, thank you very much for great work in moderating it. Oh, yeah, I wanted to say thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Andrea, for the talk. And the recording, as Andrea mentioned, will be sent to you, uh, the link to the recording in a few days time, including the PDF. And uh, it will also be on our YouTube channel. So please stay tuned. And ju just before we leave, just to remind you again, as it was said in the beginning, there will be another session, the second one of this, uh, where Professor Florin Dudrea, the CTO of CGD, will talk about gun devices in power electronics, and you will receive an invitation to this as well. I hope you enjoyed today's session and found it useful. Wishing you a really nice day and hope Thank to you. see you soon in the next session. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.